Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we thurify your brain with odorific, weird and wonderful science. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, James Hayes talks about the science of smell vision and explosive bees. Here's smelly news of light-stimulated mice and learning in your sleep. <laughs> Synthetic smells. Researchers at New York University Grossman School of Medicine have made mice experience a fake smell by stimulating the nerve cells in the olfactory bulb responsible for smell. To learn more about how brains identify odors. Smell happens when airborne molecules linked to scents trigger receptor cells lining the nose to send electric signals to nerve-ending bundles in the olfactory bulb called glomeruli, which in turn send signals to brain cells. The optogenetic mice were genetically engineered so that the nerve cells in the olfactory bulbs are stimulated to fire by light projected onto them, as well as real odours. Previous experiments have shown that olfactory bulb neurons fire into a recognisable pattern for different smells, like the score to a piece of music. Each smell stimulates its own pattern of nerve firing in the olfactory bulb. The researchers wanted to find out if once trained to recognise a particular pattern of stimulation of their olfactory bulb, the mice could recognise it again when they changed the order or timing of some of the odour notes. The researchers have no idea how their synthetic odour smells to the mice. The mice were trained to push a lever to get a sip of water whenever they smelled the right synthetic odour. After they were trained, the researchers changed the order of the odour notes and found that the mice couldn't recognise the smell at all. They found that the first notes were more important for recognition than the later notes, which could be changed completely and the mice still recognised the smell. They found if they changed the notes a little, the mice were still good at recognising the synthetic odour, but the more they changed the pattern, the less the mice were able to correctly identify it. Like changing the notes in a song, you can continue to recognise it up to the point that it sounds too different. This may mean that if you slightly modify the human brain activity that represents an orange, you would still smell something similar. Maybe recognising it as citrus, or at least fruity. The smell of coffee is still distinctly recognisable, even with a splash of vanilla added to it. The human nose is known to have 350 different kinds of odour receptors, while mice have more than 1,200 kinds of odour receptors. The researchers' next step being tested in labs around the world, is to record brain activity in response to a real odour, then activate the very same cells using optogenetics. The paper was titled, Synthetic Odours Created by Activating Brain Cells Help Neuroscientists Understand How Smell Works, and was published in the journal Science. Sleep. Smell. Learn. Researchers at the University of Freiburg and the Institute for Frontier Areas of Psychology and Mental Health in Germany have discovered that if you learn while smelling a particular odour, and then sleep next to a source of that odour, you find it easier to recall the information you learned at a later date. Learning anything new relies on the conversion of details from your short-term memory into your long-term memory, which occurs during the consolidation process. Earlier studies have demonstrated that consolidation during sleep is vital 
for building memories. Scientists are keen to understand how to influence and enhance consolidation, so some of them have looked to smell. The researchers recruited 54 sixth grade students aged 11 and 12 years old who'd already completed a year of English language instruction. They divided them into four groups and then had the students learn some English lessons and later be tested. The students had to translate German words into the equivalent English translation and also from English to German. The students also had to form their own sentences and complete given sentences with these words. The control group weren't exposed to any odours. The memory cueing odour came from unlit commercial incense sticks. The second group were exposed to a rose scent while learning at home and during the vocabulary test. The third group were exposed to rose scent while learning at home and during each night before the test, but not during the test. The fourth group were exposed to rose scent while learning at home, every night before the test, and during the test. The students were instructed to put the incense stick next to them on their desk while they were studying the English vocabulary at home, on their nightstand next to their bed while they were sleeping, and or on their desk during the vocabulary test itself, which took place seven days after the first presentation of the English words in school. Having the incense stick on the nightstand during the whole night implies that the rose fragrance was supplied during the complete sleep period in all sleep cycles. They found that the students who were exposed to the rose scent while sleeping did significantly better than the students who were not, and the students who had the rose scent while sleeping and during the exam did best. A previous study had found better test performance from odours being wafted to people in the slow-wave part of their sleep cycle only. This meant that it wasn't useful outside of a lab that can detect which stage of sleep you were in. The new study shows the learning improvement works when the odour is smelled all night, which shows that it can work at home for everyday use. The paper was titled How Odour Cues Help to optimise learning during sleep in a real-life setting, and was published in the journal Nature. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Odorific. This is the third and final part of my discussion with Dr. James Hayes about the science of odour. James is a researcher at the University of New South Wales Civil and Environmental Engineering Odour Laboratory. We spoke by Zoom and I continued our conversation by asking him, they used to try having smell in movies and TV, smell a vision with little scratch and yes. parts. <laughs> I know a few things. So uh, you can go past certain fast food restaurants in, here in Australia, and the smell is unmistakable. I'm reasonably certain that they could change their practices, but they're not going to because people have that smell, they have that association, and that's going to get more people in the door. I have heard in America they have billboards advertising particular restaurants and they have these huge vats of chemicals with a big fan behind them and they're just firing, I think it was a steak odour, onto the highway just to get people hungry for steak. Now, as a strategy long term, that's probably not going to work very well. If this is a road where people are just driving back and from for work, eventually they'll just get used to it and it won't be something that they detect or care about anymore. With regards to smell vision and things like that, I think there's a huge market for it. I think doing it properly is very challenging because, again, we're talking about a lot of different chemicals. You have to make sure that you're not offending anybody. It's a hard thing to do. I recently helped out with an art installation in Sydney where there were different odours at different tables and they were encapsulating certain fields of Sydney in the 1970s. So you would 
lift open this cup and there would be the smell of the Mardi Gras, for instance, or the smell of gum leaves and stuff. And that was a very carefully thought out thing and very carefully organized. I personally had a fantastic time when I was there. In regards to the closest thing to smell a vision that I've seen, if you go to Disney World over in the States, they have a couple of rides. I think it's called like World Tours or California Tours or something like that. They put you in, uh, essentially, it's a, like a roller coaster scenario, but you're just in a building. You're not moving anywhere, but they pretend that you are by blowing air and you have a big screen in front of you. And they also have odorants. So if you're going over a pine forest, they'll fire pine scent out there. If you're going into like the desert, they will try and recreate some of the odorants. But even then, with a huge amount of money and a huge amount of technology behind uh, Disney, me personally, I was able to say, okay, this isn't quite the odor that I think that they were trying to do. But maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just a stickler for that kind of stuff. For my personal interest, I think it would be very good for video games. I mean, we're looking at virtual reality at the moment. If we could somehow operationalize odors into video games, I think that would be a very immersive experience. Again, how to do it. I've got some ideas, but nothing's really sticking as to being commercially viable. <laughs> I saw a few things suggested for computers where they had, instead of scratch and sniff, they had little USB devices that would put out a little set of different odorants at different times, but of course you've got to refill it. Yeah, you have uh, micro droplet systems where yes. you have a, a solid form of the odorant, it heats up, produces a small droplet and then fires off. You do have to refill it. And again, I mean, I, I think you could do about six odorants before it got too much. And six odorants isn't going to encapsulate a huge amount of stuff. So it, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Look, smelling art is a fascinating idea. <laughs> and I'm sure somebody will run with some other way of doing things. So some of the technology we're working at. So honeybees, they do have pheromones. And their ability to detect, to detect things is astonishing. It, in some cases, even outperforms dogs by a wide margin. When they're having their yearly mating rituals, they will release very minute types of pheromone. They will be detected. And we're talking not parts per trillion, parts per quadrillion, parts per as many zeros as you like to put behind it. And that's quite fascinating. For my particular research, what we were looking to do is perhaps use something like an e-nose or some other form of technology where we could take air samples from the hives and then looking at the kind of chemical odors that they're emitting, translate that into saying, okay, this hive is healthy or this hive has a particular mite, this hive has a particular disease. And that would be very beneficial to um, apiarists around the country because Otherwise, what they have to do, they have to take the whole hive apart. That disturbs the hive. They're usually quite heavy. They weigh about 30 to 40 kilograms in some instances. So we we're looking at that as something viable. I think we're still going to try and go for it in some, in some capacity because we think that there's a lot of potential there. And that kind of technology, starting from that form, I think we could apply it into rural considerations if there's something wrong with a cow or if there's something wrong with another kind, like a another type of insect or whatever it might be, that kind of technology can be easily adapted to say, here is an olfactory response and we can say they have this particular disease and this is the kind of treatment that we can prescribe. What we really like about that, of course, is that it's uh, very non-invasive and I'd love to see that in the medical field as well. I'm currently in, in the middle of writing a paper in that regard. Medical um, bees. Be... Sorry? Medical bees. Medical bees, well, you have explosive detection bees, actually. I was about to ask about those. <laughs> <laughs> explosive detection bees are fantastic. So what they do, they have a little cage with a bee in it at an airport. They are trained to detect explosive chemicals, and they have a high-speed camera right next to the bee. And depending on how far their tongue goes out, determines how close you are to the particular explosive components. And that is incredible. That, that is, I'm very happy that that exists in our world. <laughs> there must be so many applications. As you're saying, explosive detection, you could put them near landmines and all sorts of things. 
Yep, actually, they've trained a particular type of rat to detect landmines. The advantage of which, of course, is that unlike dogs, they won't trigger the landmines. And they can point them out and kind of dig them up for you as well, which is really beneficial. Other applications for olfactory industries, as I like to call them, lots of rare species can be detected by dogs. Recently with koalas and a lot of habitat loss, there's some great work being done up in Queensland to collect individuals. There is a lot of quarantine work that goes into sniffer dogs. There, uh, I can't remember the name of the island, but there is a dog whose sole duty it is to ensure cane toads don't reach their shores. And he inspects every single ship, sees if there's any cane toads, and he moves on. And he detected one dead one once. So obviously shipping's doing something very good. And obviously this dog is absolutely right on it, which is fantastic. Oh, dogs in the past detected estrus in cows. So a whole heap of different ways to use our sense of smell. And it's, it's not invasive. It can be trained. And I, I think it has a lot of implications for the future. That's wonderful. So the reason that, well, this is one of the main reasons, and this is one of the main reasons I hate this particular philosopher. Aristotle called the sense of smell the most base of all the senses, not worthy of our attention. And I think that's kind of translated throughout the ages. And I think he's got a lot to answer for. (laughs) Later on, obviously, you had a sense of smell used by doctors and things to identify certain diseases and disorders. The example of, um, I can't remember his name now, but his work was preceded by Jon Snow looking at a particular pump that had typhus. And the idea at the time was that it was bad odors that were causing people to get ill and not the diseases themselves. So I'm not saying that your sense of smell is completely without fault. It was a dominant theory at the time that that was what was causing the bad things and that was just not the case. And I think recently your sense of smell, because of its non-invasive quality, will find itself in more applied to medical issues. There are things where they're taking these odorous compounds that we personally might not be able to detect People are breathing into tubes and things like that. And you can say they have a particular lung cancer and things like that. My wife works at the Colling Institute and she looks at breath research and she doesn't look at VOC. She looks at proteins, but the practice is quite similar. So I think there's a lot of applications for the future. And if we can just shake off what Aristotle said all those years ago, I think we'd be a lot better for it. <laughs> I can give you some interesting facts if you like. I can oh, say sure. what the worst, worst odor of all time was. Yes. The worst odor of all time is something called thioacetone. Thioacetone is so incredibly smelly. They once, I think, broke a vial in a German laboratory and the nearby town had to be evacuated because people were fainting, vomiting, nausea, dizziness, hyper-aggressive, went on for kilometers and had to be scrubbed because it stuck around. Real bad odor. The worst odor in food is almost unquestionably something called surstroming. Have you heard of surstroming? I um, don't think I have. Okay, so I believe it's a Norwegian delicacy. It is where you get a fish, you put it in a tin, but you allow it to ferment in the tin. The fermentation process produces a great deal of sulfur to the point where the tin actually expands from the outside. It is very sulfurous. I would call it almost dangerous in some instances, especially if it goes off. I don't know how you can distinguish between when it's okay or not. And it is so horrifically bad. It's been used in a lot of legal cases where someone has slipped and dropped a tin of surstroming at their apartment block and they've had to evacuate the apartment. (laughs) Uh, It's illegal to take it on airplanes for any reason whatsoever. So yeah, thoroughly unpleasant. What typically uh, Norwegians do is that they have a big bucket of water, they pierce the lid, allow all the odorant to come off, and then they can enjoy their meal after that. So you've got to open it under the water to control the odour? Yeah, I mean, it'll control it to a point where it'll be somewhat tolerable as opposed to incredibly unpleasant because a lot of those, a lot of those unpleasant chemicals, they're quite, uh, they're quite dense. And so they'll just kind of float and stay in the water. A lot of them won't. A lot of them will go to the surface, but it's, it's acceptable, <laughs> I suppose. There is a word for the smell of rain, and this was invented by two Australians, and it's called petrichor. 
And petrichor is the basically these little minute microbes in asphalt and other things flying up and breathing with each other. And that is the smell of rain, petrichor. I believe you can actually grow them in a jar. Oh, you can probably grow them anywhere. I mean, <laughs> dig up a bit of soil and just yes. keep them around. They're very resilient to changes in humidity and that kind of thing. And once they get a bit of water, they'll, they'll happily go for it. No problem there. <laughs> Terrific. I suppose I would like to encourage people, if, if, if they want to, pay a little bit more attention to your sense of smell. If you're smelling something unusual, try and put a name to it. Try and describe what it is that you're detecting. And you'll find that, at least me personally, I found it to be kind of an enlightening experience as I'm walking around shopping aisles, as I'm uh, walking around streets. Even the unpleasant smells have their own qualities about them. And it kind of makes certain experiences for me a lot more immersive. Well, James Hayes, thank you very much. Oh, not at all. Thank you so much for having me. That was the final part of my interview with James Hayes about odour. James is a researcher from the University of New South Wales Oda Laboratory, which you can find at oda.unsw.edu.au. Time when man began to control the environment, he has been plagued by his limited ability to speculate. His failure to accurately predict the effect in the contraposed action. This is the result of his not being able to consider and relate all the factors in a problem. Evidence of this inability can be seen in the persistence of a certain kind of myth involving three wishes. In a frantic effort to reap immediate rewards, the first wish is often not too wise. The second usually tends to overcorrect. Our hero can consider himself lucky if after the last wish, he ends up just where he started. But there were men whose wishes were not only prudent, but had a habit of coming true. These men and women were artists and had certain characteristics in common. They were seldom bored with anything. They were constantly building up stores of information in active memory banks. When confronted with a specific need, they would call on these memory banks for information, which they would run through, sort out, and relate to the problem at hand. These men could speculate and could predict. They were artists, artists in many fields, architecture, mechanics, medicine, science, politics, and the art of relating factors. It is often not a conscious art, and the degree to which it is operative can tend to make one normal, bright, super bright, or genius. Numbers were used to count, but soon they were also being used as abstract symbols for states of being. Values were given to mass, speed, inertia, and the forces of gravity. Such measurement was an enormous help to creative thinking. Man was learning to numerically relate and to predict. Theories were developed by which the many factors in a problem could be numerically related. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. 
follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin McLeod of Incombatech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2MVR in Embarker Valley, 3MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2XXFM in Canberra. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station, and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. Check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf. Support Diffusion by buying from the affiliate links at diffusionradio.com slash support. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.